Welcome to this new lesson of the bacteriology course. Today we're going to talk about a very famous, unfortunately very famous bacterium, which is called Escherichia coli. I'm sure that you already know everything about it. Uh, I mean, the symptoms that derive from uh, an Escherichia coli infection. And then well, we will talk also about another uh, less famous bacterium, which is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So, Let's first of all talk about Escherichia coli. This bacterium is a gram-negative bacterium, which is a facultative anaerobic bacterium and with a rod, a rod shape, okay? Um, it is a commensal bacterium. Uh, it means that uh, it is found inhabiting the lower intestine of warm-blooded animals. So it, it, it is also found in human beings, of course. Uh, a small proportion of Escherichia coli strains are pathogenic, so fortunately the most part of the Escherichia coli strains are mm, normal. I mean, uh, they normally live in our organism without giving us any kind of problem, right? The harmless strains produce vitamin K and prevent colonization of the intestine by pathogenic bacteria. So it is also, it's not only that they don't cause anything, but they, they are also essential for our organism because they are important for the synthesis of many different molecules and many different uh, important substances that we are obliged to take from the outside, from the food, because we are not able to synthesize them uh, independently. Uh, and then it is also important, uh, the presence of these bacteria uh, is also important because it prevents us from being uh, invaded from other kinds of pathogenic bacteria. Escherichia coli is classified into serotypes based on cell wall. In fact, in the cell wall we can find an antigen which is called O antigen, based on capsular antigen which is called K, fimbrial antigen F and flagell flagellar antigen H. An, uh, a very famous example of Escherichia coli is the O157H7. So, which are the pathogenic strains? Uh, the first one is EHEC, which uh, stands for Enterohemorrhagic Escherichia coli. Then we have ETEC, that stands for Enterotoxigenic Escherichia coli. Then we have EIEC that stands for enteroinvasive Escherichia coli and finally we have EPEC that stands for enteropathogenic Escherichia coli. EHEC is a strain of Escherichia coli that produces cytokines and disrupt protein synthesis within host cells. These toxins are also called verocytoxins or shiga-like toxins. Uh, this bacterium is uh, pathogenic to humans and it produces verocytotoxins that form attaching and effacing lesions on epithelial cells. Infections occur via uh, the fecal oral route. Symptoms range from mild diarrhea to severe bloody diarrhea and complications include hemolytic uremic syndrome uh, which can lead to death if untreated of course. Uh, a common serotype, as I told you, is Escherichia coli O 157H7. ETEC uh, is famous to cause uh, the traveler's diarrhea. Infection leads to watery diarrhea which may last up to a week, so it's not something really fast. Symptoms include abdominal cramps, sometimes nausea and headache. It establishes itself by adhering to the epithelium of the small intestine via colonization factor antigens, CFA. This is followed by expression of heat-stable or heat-label enterotoxins. These toxins increase adenylate cyclase, so CAMP levels, and the secretion of chloride ions and water. It is also transmitted via a fecal oral route uh, following ingestion, our organisms invade epithelial cells of the intestine, resulting in a mild form of dysentery. Illness is characterized by presence of blood and mucus in stools of infected individuals. 
Characteristic features of these bacteria are their ability to introduce entry into epithelial cells and disseminate from cell to cell. Uh, this bacterium infection can occur through contaminated food or water or through uh, mechanical factors such as uh, flies. The genes required for entry are clustered on a virulence-associated invasion plasmid in these strains. Following ingestion, uh, these organisms adhere to the epithelial cells um, of the intestine, causing watery or bloody diarrhea again. Adherence is mediated by an adherence factor and uh, an adhesin. Uh, this bacterium uh, attaches and alters the integrity of the intestine. And bloody diarrhea is associated with attachment and an acute tissue destructive process. That's why we can also have bloody diarrhea. Uh, this strain does not produce toxins, so this is a very important thing if we want to fight against it. Uh, their virulence mechanism involves the formation of attaching and effective lesions followed by interference with host cell signal transduction. Uh, and this strain is most commonly associated with uh, pediatrics, uh, kids' infections. We have many different tests that we can do in laboratories to identify the bacterium. And we also have some molecular methods like the PCR, that stands for polymerase chain reaction. It amplifies a specific gene target. So the primers used in PCR may detect a characteristic virulence factor as well as other genes. Closely related, since closely related Escherichia coli have different genes encoding the O antigen, it can be exploited to differentiate between different strains. We also have real-time PCR, uh, that is a fluorescence uh, method used to detect the presence or the absence of a particular gene. And what about the treatment? That is basically the most important thing that we have to say when speaking about a bacterium or viral infection. Well, patients, especially healthy adults, need no treatment for Escherichia coli infection because it is self-limited, fortunately, the most, most of the time. Uh, it's dif the situation is different when we are talking about patients which are also already um, weakened by uh, other pathologies. In some studies, it has been noticed that treatment with antibiotics uh, increases the chances of getting infections of this kind and also of other kinds. This effect occurs because antibiotics destroys the bacterial cell wall, causing them to release even more toxins. So when necessary, treatment includes the replacement of fluids and electrolytes to treat or prevent dehydration. Let's pass on Pseudomonas bacteria. It is a large group of aerobic, non-sporing, gram-negative bacteria motile by the presence of polar flagella. Uh, they have been found uh, in nature. Uh, in particular, they have been found in water, soil um, and other moist environments. Some of them are pathogenic to plants, uh, others are pathogenic to other animals, like human beings. Pseudomonas are widely distributed in soil and water. Uh, they have a rod shape, they are, as I told you, are aerobic, motile, they produce water-soluble pigments. And we can say that they are opportunistic pathogens, that means that they cause infections in uh, the susceptible uh, hosts. So, for example, a, a person who uh, is already ill for other reasons or other situation where uh, the host is weaker than the bacterium itself. Uh, they escape the defense mechanisms by a loose capsule in which micro colonies of bacillus are enmeshed and protected from host defenses. Pseudomonas aeruginosa colonies are really particular because they, they are um, a fluorescent greenish color and a sweet odor and they have the capacity of uh, doing the, the beta hemolysis. Uh, they are able to produce many different pigments like uh, pyocyanin or pyoverdin or pyomelanin and others. The identification of Pseudomonas aeruginosa is usually based on oxidase tests and its colonial morphology. 
So the fact that they are able to uh, to do the beta hemolysis, the presence of characteristic pigments, the sweet odor, as I told you, and their ability to grow at around 42 degrees. They are obligate aerobe, but they grow anaerobically if nitrate is available. Growth occurs at wide range of temperatures, so between 6 to 42 degrees, the optimum is about 37 degrees. The growth on ordinary uh, media is the most common situation and they produce large opaque irregular colonies with distinctive, musty, mokish or earthy smell. Iridescent patches with metallic sheen are seen in cultures on nutrient agar. They are motile by a single or multiple polar flagella uh, as the other pseudomona uh, strains are gram-negative rods, they are strict aerobes, um, the most strains are strict aerobes, they are oxidase and catalase positive. This bacterium is responsible for nosocomial infections, suppurative otitis, localized and generalized infections, urinary tract infection after catheterization, for example, uh, iatrogenic meningitis, and post tracheostomy pulmonary infections, for example. So in hospitals is, is a really common bacterium. It's not so common uh, outside the hospital, fortunately. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is widely distributed in nature and is commonly present in moist environments, in hospitals, as I told you. So not only in hospitals, but also in environments, in moist environments. It is pathogenic only when introduced into areas devoid of normal defenses. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can infect almost any external site or organ. It is invasive and toxigenic. It attaches to and colonizes the mucous membrane or skin and it invades locally and produces systematic diseases and septicemia. Uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa is resistant to many antibiotics, as I told you, so we have to be very careful to choose the right ones. It becomes dominant when more susceptible bacteria of the normal flora are suppressed. So we have also to be careful not to use a lot of antibiotics in, during our life, because in this way we make uh, the pathogenic bacteria uh, really strong. The clinical presentation that we may have are uh, septicemia, endocarditis, uh, or for example diarrhea, fever, uh, or other, uh, other infections like eye infections. Um, the other dangerous thing is that the bacterium survives with minimal nutrients, so it is able to replicate even if it doesn't have a lot of food, it doesn't have a lot of oxygen, so, uh, so it attacks the weak people first of all, Second of all, it is also able to replicate in a very easy way. Third of all, it is resistant to many antibiotics. So imagine what can it do in a hospital where there is an, an enormous number of really weak people, where uh, there is an enormous uh, number of interactions, of human interactions. Beforehand, I talk about septic fibrosis. And do you know why? Because this bacterium uh, is of a particular concern to individuals with cystic fibrosis who are highly susceptible to Pseudomonas lung infections. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also of great concern to cancer and bird patients as well as those people who are immunocompromised, as I told you. The case fatality rate for individuals infected with Pseudomonas aeruginosa approaches 50%. So which are its toxins? We have exotoxin A and S. Exotoxin A uh, as NADA's uh, enzyme uh, resembles to diphtheria toxin. It has got also other proteases, elastases, hemolysins and enterotoxins. Pseudomonas aeruginosa is an opportunistic pathogen, meaning that it exploits some break in the host defenses to initiate an infection. In fact, this bacterium is the epitome of an opportunistic pathogen of humans. The bacterium almost never infects uncompromised tissues, yet there is hardly any tissue that it cannot infect 
if the tissue defenses are compromised in some manner. So it rarely causes disease in healthy people. In most cases of infection, the integrity of a physical barrier to infection, for example skin, mucous membrane and others, uh, is lost or an underlying immune def uh, deficiency, for, for example neutropenia, immunosuppression, is present. Adding to its pathogenicity, this bacterium has minimal nutritional requirements and can tolerate a, a wide variety of conditions uh, as well as it can tolerate an enormous range uh, of antibiotics, of different kinds of antibiotics. So it causes urinary uh, tract infections, respiratory system infections, dermatitis, soft tissue infections, bacteremia, bone and joint infections, gastrointestinal infections and variety of systematic infections, particularly in patients with severe burns and in cancer and AIDS patients who are immunosuppressed. So combined antibiotic therapy is generally required to avoid resistance that develops rapidly when single drugs are employed. Avoid using inappropriate broad spectrum antibiotics which can suppress the normal flora and permit overgrowth of resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This is a very important thing. This lesson has come to an end so I'll see you next time where we'll talk about another very interesting bacterium. Bye!